Saturday, July 4th, Independence Day. I sat on the veranda of the shack, drinking coffee and watching the light of dawn rise over the city and county in the valley below me. Bauer sat next to me, enjoying the way I scratched him, probably more than the view. It was a beautiful morning, promising a wonderful day. After the week I had just experienced, a relaxing and calm day was exactly what I needed. I decided to let go of all the problems that had befallen my world. The crime consultant, Ake the real Moriarty, Ake the shadow, the eye by investigation into the death of Henry R. Wargrave, KSTD's Priya Ajmani's continuing to irritate investigations into the Jack Burke tapes and the death of the dreaded Reverend Jonas Oldids, and of course, the continued activities of Oldids' organization and the white supremacist group Superior Bloodlines. Instead, I thought positive thoughts. Yesterday, Friday, July 3rd, my wife Laura, her sister and Melina, my mother Phillies, and other women had a big girls' night out, which was actually a full day of activities. I was glad to stay at the shack. I invited Cindy Ross and her fiancé Jenna Stiles to stay in the guest room, and the reason for that was another guest and her little son who also came, Molly Evans, Cindy's sister, and the mother of this little one, my son Ross. When Molly arrived, I went to the door to let her in. I took little Ross, who seemed to be in a good mood, and then Cindy showed up. This was their first meeting since Cindy had learned on vision that she was my cousin and also the daughter of Dr. P. Harvey Eckhart. Molly was there and Cindy was not happy that Molly knew that Cindy was an illegitimate love child, but didn't tell her. Molly was also clearly nervous before this meeting, so it was a big relief to both of us when Cindy walked up to Molly and gave her a big hug. Molly responded with a long hug. Why don't you two go out on the veranda, I said. I'll babysit for Ross. How do you like that, Ross? Dog, Ross said, pointing to Bauer in the living room. Yes, Bauer was a magnet for girls and children in these parts, I thought. Armed with adult drinks, Cindy and Molly sat on the veranda, overlooking the magnificent view of the city. Cindy spoke first. It was quite a shocking night for me said the extremely slender platinum blonde. But I understand why you didn't say anything beforehand. I thought about it and what I would have done if our roles were reversed. If I knew something like that about you, I don't know what I would do or say. Yes, Molly said. And although I knew some things, I didn't know who your biological father was. Mom didn't tell me. But leave it to Ironbreaker so that he would not only know but also find a way to tell everyone at the most opportune moment. Cindy smiled. And I noticed that you stood up for me when our parents didn't show up after Ross was born. What they did really hurt, and even knowing it doesn't justify their actions. They are what they are. Molly said, changing her position, her pregnancy already starting to show. And they won't change. Neither will you. And neither will I, although I learned from Dawn, treat you as an individual and don't worry about your choices about others. Yes, said Cindy. He told me the same thing, but I still don't like the fact that my sexuality is not accepted and Jenna feels it much more than I do. I'm a political atheist. I don't care about all this nonsense, but Jenna, every day is becoming more and more partisan. Sounds like someone who is honing his pitch for a future run for district attorney. Molly said wisely. Cindy's eyebrows rose in surprise, but all she said was, well, at least you're here when she and I sleep together in the guest room. Molly smiled. Well, I'll be in the other room sleeping with a married man who knocked me up twice, and I don't care who you're with having sex. I'm going to have this married man until I lose my breath. Heh, said Cindy. Okay, let's change the subject. How are things in Midtown? Molly frowned. Not really. My promotion to lieutenant is delayed, as you know. But worse, Captain Moynihan is being given a hard time by his superiors. Our team is investigating three cases. One of them is the murder of a young CIA agent, Mike. Another murder involves illegal substances from Southport, which may be more than just a channel. And finally, the reporter was investigating a group called Victory Christian Ministries. They may have ties to Oldid's organization. 
the reporter, who is a man, was beaten to within an inch of his life. Attacked and shot, he miraculously survived and is recovering. We investigated the attack on him. Molly continued, the assistant chief closed all three investigations. Moynihan went to the chief, who is a personal friend of his. The chief told my captain that he had no choice but to support the assistant chief. The assistant chief then threatened Moynihan for going over his head. Moynihan is a combat veteran who could match Don with a crowbar, and he told the assistant chief where to put his threats. I'd say it's a parallel to you and that idiot Brownlee. Oh, wow, said Cindy. Did you tell Don about this? Absolutely, Molly said. I was hoping that Don could find a loophole that would allow him and you to come in as SBI reservists and reopen the investigations. Don said he would try to look into it behind the scenes, but he doesn't have time to come and open the cases. Cindy laughed, which sounded more like Bauer barking. It just means Don is quietly investigating this. I know he's come across the name Victory Christian Ministries before. By the way, don't say that out loud again. Of course, an SBI is so funny, Molly said. Director Lewis hates Don, but he hates the city police even more. He openly boasts that Don arrested Susan Wexler for two murders, saying that the entire city police force is just as corrupt. He then opens an investigation into Wargrave's death, despite the fact that city police and coroner called it a suicide. Yeah, Cindy hissed. I know all too well Director Lewis's interest in the Wargrave case. I told his nasty agents I wouldn't talk to them without legal representation after they almost framed me for Wargrave's murder. So, did you tell Don about Captain Moynihan too? Yes, Molly said. Don just smiled that little smile he does sometimes and said not to worry that he would work it out. Ooh, of course, Cindy gasped, looking at the city. The train has just appeared on the western horizon. What? Molly asked, peering at her sister. Uh, nothing, said Cindy. I just think I know what does Don does. But it's better not to say anything, especially if I'm right. All I'll say is that you made an analogy to me and Brownlee. You may be more right than you realize. I was standing near the starting line on the north side of Reservoir Lake. The district's Independence Day triathlon was scheduled to begin in less than an hour. I was wearing a light blue shirt with a gold TCPD badge embroidered on the left chest, khaki pants, and practical brown shoes, and of course my khaki tilly hat with badge and paratrooper wings. And then, oh, my, God. My wife Laura was walking towards me. She was wearing a tight white blouse, a beautiful very blue skirt, and flat shoes but her raven black hair was styled in soft waves and light curls, not disheveled, but still voluminous. Paired with red lipstick and just the right amount of makeup to suit her, she looked stunning. She noticed my gaze, full of falling in love with her again and again. She smiled shyly as she approached me. Oh, wow, I managed to whisper. You just, oh my God, I'm speechless. You're so beautiful. Oh, thanks, said Laura. I hoped you'd like it. I'll like it, I said. I'm delighted. Now I understand what you did yesterday. I took her hand. Come with me. I want to show everyone here that I am the happiest man in the world with the most beautiful wife in the world. Hand in hand, we walked to where the participants were preparing for the race. I saw my nephew Todd, who was tall and towered over most of the crowd. His racing partner Teddy Franklin was nearby and there was Teresa Croyle next to Todd. She was off duty today and was wearing a tight t-shirt, tennis shoes, and a pair of denim Daisy Dukes mini shorts that showed off her curvy hips. I suspected I knew what Todd had been up to last night. Hi, guys, I said, walking up with Laura. Oh, wow, Aunt Laura, Todd exclaimed, his eyes lighting up. Great hairstyle. Yes, wow, Teresa said. You look great. Thank you. Laura said, smiling sweetly. I decided to try something new and see if my husband would notice. And I noticed. I said, I'm almost ready to take her somewhere far away. I wouldn't judge you. Todd said with a mischievous smile. Teresa frowned, but
but her eyes betrayed her amusement. Todd, we need to check in, said Teddy. See you later, Todd said. Hey, we have the winning number from last year, Team 29. Teresa smiled. She and Cindy were Team 29 and finished as champions. You better keep up the winning tradition. I warned. Todd just grinned and walked away. As Laura and I walked toward the spectator area, we met many people we knew, and Laura received approving glances. I put my arm around her waist, pulling her towards me, proud to be her husband and to be with her. Oh, here's the hottest couple around. I heard a familiar voice. I turned to see Elsie Gringer and her niece, reporter Bettina Wurzberg. Elsie was a gossip columnist in the area and said these words. Laura and I greeted them. You look absolutely stunning, Mrs. Troy, said Elsie. The fashion world approves. Just like her lucky husband, I said, and you can quote me. The women laughed. Then Bettina said, can I have a quick interview, Commander? Certainly, I said in an extremely generous mood. Bettina took out her voice recorder. I'm at the triathlon starting line with Commander Donald Troy, said Bettina. Commander, it looks like we're having a great celebration today, the best race visit ever. Yes, I said. We have the largest number of participants in triathlon, and I don't think I've ever seen such a large crowd, other than at university football games, of course. Commander, your police team won the race last year, said Bettina, but Captain Ross cannot participate this year due to injuries received last year. How does she take it? Pretty good, I said. She loves to compete, but she understands the situation, and somewhere in there, she supports today's police team. What about you, Commander? asked Bettina with a sparkle in her eyes. You're on a police team, but your nephew is on the Bow Enterprises team. Whose side are you on? I smiled. We also have a varsity rock team, and as a former rock cadet, I'm rooting for them too. I think I'll win, no matter who wins. The Bradley Rangers are looking to take gold this year after nearly winning last year, said Bettina. Are they the main competitors? I think they will be among the leaders, I said. And at that moment Bettina and I noticed a small entourage making its way through the crowd. I saw white hair. Okay, Bettina, I said. The interview is over. I went back to Laura, who was being interviewed by Elsie Gringer. Hand in hand, we walked towards the group. Of course, at the center of the human solar system was Dr. P. Harvey Eckhart. He was wearing a light blue button-down shirt, khaki pants, brown slipper-like shoes, and a dark blue jacket. His daughter walked next to him. Cindy was wearing an almost identical shirt, khaki skirt, and mid-heeled shoes. The expression on Cindy's face was one I had almost never seen. Oh, wow, I said quietly to Laura. I don't think I've ever seen her so happy. Agree, said Laura. The perfect remedy for her not being able to race. A public appearance with her father. They walked over to us, and Cindy praised Laura and hugged her while I hugged Harvey. He had two bodyguards and several followers with him, as always. They welcomed me as part of their family, and I did the same. Ah, young Donald, said Eckhart. And my dear Laura, you look beautiful. He hugged my wife like his daughter. Young Donald is a very lucky man, I dare say. No doubt, I said as Laura put her arm around my waist. By the way, Cindy, Todd, and Teddy are Relay Team 29, and I told them to keep it a winning tradition. Cindy smiled. Yes, they'd be better. Bettina tried to interview Cindy as the entourage moved on, asking if Cindy missed being in the race. Cindy responded, For the record, I'm very happy just to be alive and here to watch with my family and friends. She didn't say anything else on the record, nor outside it. Okay, we're almost ready to start the race, said the radio presenter as I listened through an almost invisible earpiece. The Bradley Rangers team is looking forward to the start. Team Bow Enterprises, who are competing in the race for the first time, is also ready. This year's police team consists of SWAT members Claire Michaels and Hugh Hewitt, and we will see if they can defend the title.
won by their colleagues Ross and Croyle last year. Everyone knows the story. Ross was seriously injured the day after the race and Croyle refused to run without her partner, showing how close their bond is. Without a doubt, I thought. I heard the starting gun go off and the teams cheered as the first stages ran into the water. Teddy Franklin ran the first leg and Todd was the anchor. Claire Michaels started for the police team. The announcer said, and Franklin from the boat team is in the lead. Bradley is in second place, trying to pass Franklin. The Roddick team is in third place, followed by the fire team and the first Baptist church team, which is participating for the first time. Then comes Michaels from the police team and the Kiwanis club. At that moment, a group of people approached us. District Councilwoman Kelly Carnes and Pastor Raymond Westboro, also a member of the council. Kelly was not my best friend on or off the board. There were several other Baptists with them. Ah, Commander, Mrs. Troy. Kelly said with a voice bordering on condescending contempt. Ah, Mrs. Carnes, I said. The First Baptist Church team is doing well, according to the radio announcer. I believe your husband is on that team. Yes, he, Carnes said, but I don't think anyone can beat your nephew. Hearing this, Pastor Westboro quickly said, How are you, Commander? Professor, it's very nice to see you. Your new hairstyle suits you very well. Thank you, Pastor, Laura said politely. Ah, Captain Ross, Westboro said as he saw Cindy approaching. It's great to see you again although I'm sure you'd rather be swimming competitively now. Yes, Pastor, Cindy said, but I'm very happy and grateful to be alive and just here to watch with my family and friends. Really, Westboro said, the Lord has watched over you this year. May he continue to watch over you. Oh, hello, Dr. Eckhart, I didn't know you were here. Westboro's voice became considerably less friendly at the sight of Eckhart, the founder and great leader of the vision. Ah, Pastor Westboro, said Harvey Eckhart, with a slight hint of wit in his voice that I had never heard before. I'm so glad to see you again. You've done such a good job building your church to, what, 2,000 members? I realized that this was not a compliment. Eckhart had hundreds of thousands of participants in his seminars over the years, and thousands of them were devoted to his teachings. Yes, the Lord has been very good to me, Westboro said, but I am only his servant on earth and for all the billions of souls in his care. Certainly, Eckhart said, his blue eyes sparkling, reminding me of the woman who inherited those eyes. Young Donald, did you know that the Westboro pastor was a good friend of that father of yours, the late Jonas Oldeds? Yes, Dr. Eckhart, I said. I remember inviting Pastor Westboro to Oldid's trailer on that unfortunate day Oldid's didn't make it. Yes, terrible day, Westboro said. I could see that he was unhappy that Eckhart mentioned it. To be honest, I didn't want to remember it either. At that moment, Teresa approached. Cindy, we need to go now, before the road is closed to police cars. Right, said Cindy. She hugged Eckhart saying she would see him at the finish line. As she and Teresa walked into the crowd, Kelly Carnes turned to me. Is your vice lieutenant wearing a new police uniform, Commander? She asked contemptuously. My nephew likes it. I answered with a smile. And yes, it would be standard police equipment if I could work it out. Eckhart laughed, and even the Westboro pastor smiled. Laura, we need to go too, I said. Have a nice day, everyone. As we walked towards my police SUV, another entourage was approaching us. I was hoping to avoid this meeting. Bad luck. Ah, Commander Troy. State Senator Catherine Woodburn called. No crowbar today? Ah, Senator, how are you? I said. No, today is such a holiday that I don't feel the need for it. Although with so many politicians around, maybe I should reconsider my decision. Oh, hello, Congressman Condor. Yes, he was with Woodburn in their retinue, followed by assistants and a couple of men who acted as bodyguards, despite their failed attempts to hide their true purpose. Hello, Commander Troy, Mrs. Troy. Condor said with a forced smile, extending his hand, 
which I politely shook. Very glad to see you again. So, Commander, Woodburn said, has Director Lewis contacted you yet? About what? I answered. Well, it's not worth giving away the secret, but he's going to ask you to lead the investigation into the murder of Henry Wargrave. With your abilities, I'm sure you'll quickly find the killer or killers. No, Senator, he has not contacted me about this yet. I said, pretending to be cheerful. I hope he will not be disappointed if I find out that it was indeed a suicide and that Mr. Wargrave's murderer was Mr. Wargrave himself. I'm sure you'll do great, as always, said Condor, trying to remain friendly. If you'll excuse us, Catherine, we need to greet Pastor Westboro and Councilman Carnes. They passed us by. Is she serious? Laura asked when I opened the door for her. I didn't answer until I got behind the wheel and closed the door. I heard rumors that Lewis wants to ask me for it. I said, I'm not sure what he's expecting. Maybe he thinks I'll say no so he can use it in the press. What will you do? Laura asked. I smiled. A smile that no criminal would ever want to see. Oh, I'll cooperate fully, I said. I am confident that I will find all the evidence to show that Mr. Henry Wargrave committed suicide by jumping from his office window. Then I said, By the way, I noticed a lot of people call you Mrs. Troy today. I wonder why that is. I don't know, Laura said, but I like being called that, and I like being Mrs. Troy. I love that you're Mrs. Troy too, I said, and I'm very proud to have you as my Mrs. Troy. Uo, Laura said, enjoying the compliments. I leaned over and kissed my wife on her luscious lips. Damn it, I am a happy man, I thought. And Parker comes out of the water well ahead of Bradley Ranger, the radio host said. Todd Burke is currently swimming the second leg of a triathlon, up and down a long section of Reservoir Lake. He is swimming effortlessly and at incredible speed. Next is another Bradley Ranger, followed by the Rock team, and in third place is the Fire team. How young Todd Burke is swimming, this race may be for second place. Cindy led Dr. Eckhart into her office at police headquarters. It's small, but it's my own office, she said, walking around her desk but not sitting down. Eckhart looked around. That's enough, my dear, he said. The size and furnishings of the office do not matter. What matters is what it represents and your achievements that allowed you to receive the keys to this door. I am very proud of these achievements and of you. Cindy smiled, blushing slightly, as Eckhart looked at the photos on the wall. Her at the Miss Physical America competition, her and Teresa with their medals for winning the triathlon last year, photos of Ross and Molly and Carol and Jim. Oh, is that your blue crowbar on the wall? asked Eckhart, seeing this object mounted on small pins driven into a wooden plaque. Yes, sir, Cindy said. This is the one the Don used to beat up Molotov. He gave it to me when he was promoted and assigned me to follow him to the UGD. Don't tell anyone, but the school metal shop melted down parts of the machine gun captured in the raid when I was wounded, and they made a new crowbar for me. Teresa, Don, Molly, and his mother are going to give it to me tomorrow, on the anniversary of that day. I wasn't supposed to know about it, but I did. Eckhart smiled. Ah, it came to you, didn't it? Cindy nodded. Eckhart said, It's amazing what the human mind can do, my dear. You have tremendous power that you are just beginning to harness. Cindy looked at her father, realizing how right he was. Eckhart said, I have one small request, my dear. May I see young Donald's office? Of course, Cindy said. He's right down the hall. Leaving her office, she turned left from the reception area into the hallway, then left again at the next door. Walking through the darkened reception area, she tried the lock on the commander's door and found it open. Ah, Eckhart said as he entered the room, lit only by sunlight streaming through the window on the back wall. Cindy, did Donald choose this office himself? Oh yeah, Cindy said. He was constantly trying to convince Chief Griswold to let him move here. For a long time, the chief didn't agree, but Don't often worked here when he wanted to be alone, and he came here to relax or prepare for something important, 
like that time was going to meet his nephew Ned for the last time. Finally, the chief relented, and even when he was promoted to commander, he stayed here and did not move into the office next to the chief. Yes, Eckhart whispered, looking around. I understand. Donald feels it. He subconsciously feels the energy of this room. Do you feel it, Cindy? Let your mind feel it, my dear. Cindy relaxed and allowed her mental flow of sensations to explore the space and understood what her father was talking about. There was something subtle but palpable in the room, energy. Oh yeah, she said. I think I know what you mean, Eckhart said. And one day this office will be yours. When young Donald surrenders to the inevitable and becomes chief of police. Cindy's eyes widened at this prediction, which she felt would actually come true one day. So, my dear, said Eckhart, what is that interesting sculpture on the bookshelf behind Donald's desk? And that painting he hasn't hung on the wall yet. Oh, the picture appeared at the UGD when he was promoted and put in charge of us, Cindy said. It's a picture of the Trojan horse and the fall of Troy, and a sculpture of matches and toothpicks appeared on his desk one day with a message inside from a criminal. It touched Don's sarcastic sense of humor. Oh, this is much more than just a joke, child, Eckhart said, looking at the sculpture. Whoever sent this is a man of incredibly deep evil. The Don will be tested to the limits of his powers. It is very good that he is working with you to destroy this evil. Cindy pondered these words in silence. And Franklin from Team Bo is already on the bike portion of the race, said the radio presenter. Todd Burke has opened a big gap in front of the Bradley Rangers. Now Bradley takes the bike and begins. Franklin maintains the lead, but doesn't extend it, while the Rock and Fire teams begin their bike portion of this grueling course. Hewitt of the police team is behind, but finally gets out of the water, and Michaels takes the baton and runs to his bike. Molly Evans was on the veranda of the shack. She could see the road far below and saw the first cyclist riding from left to right as Teddy Franklin rounded the end of the mountain and headed north towards the city. Phillies Troy stepped out onto the veranda. Has anyone reached the road yet, dear? Yes, one cyclist just passed, Molly answered, as children. Ross and Jim are napping and Carol is playing with Bauer, said Phillies. He's the most patient dog I've ever seen letting this little girl put hats and clothes on him. Molly laughed. He's a sweet dog, and he really loves kids. Molly said, Ross loves him too. I wish he could see more of Bauer, and Don and you and Cindy. Be patient and have faith, dear. Philly said, her voice sounding mysterious. I have a feeling that everything will work out well. Did Don say something? Molly asked hopefully. I can't imagine what he can do other than move to Midtown. No, his home is here, said Phillies. He didn't say anything, but I know my son, and I know there's something brewing in his head. Molly laughed again. Oh, another cyclist passed, said Phillies, and a couple more. I think I'll go now. Don wanted me to bring Carol to the office. Why, Molly asked, perplexed. Don't know, said Phillies but my son always has his reasons, even if they seem strange. Laura and I parked at the police headquarters, then went inside to rest a bit and get ready for the race when the crowds began to gather. We planned to be at the finish line at the fair. As the door closed behind us, Laura said, Looks like Todd and Teddy are going to win easily in MFF. I approached my wife from behind, pulled her towards me, turned her around and kissed her juicy, painted lips. Mm, I said, breaking the kiss. I've wanted to do this from the moment I saw you this morning. I kissed Laura deeply again. We kissed hotly, my hands explored her sexy body. It didn't take long until I took off her blouse. We helped each other take off our clothes. Then I directed my wife to the bed. As Cindy was showing Dr. Eckhart around the Ugged Room, two more people entered the office. Joanna Cummings was showing her boyfriend, Seth Warner, the controls. Oh, Dr. Eckhart, Joanna admired when Cindy introduced him. It's such an honor to meet you. Mutually, my young friend, said Eckhart, 
I've heard good things about you, from your captain and also from your friend, the lovely Mrs. Allgood. Oh, you know Melina, said Joanna. She's so wonderful. Oh, this is my friend Seth. Honor, Dr. Seth said, shaking Eckhart's hand. Ah, thank you, young Seth, said Eckhart. I'm very happy to hear that you and your business are thriving. I believe you have a very promising future from what I hear. Thank you, sir, said Seth. And I'm sure, Eckhart said, his voice becoming hoarse, his eyes sparkling, and he gave that sinister smile I've often seen, that you and Miss Cummings will soon be much more than friends, I'm right. I wouldn't mind that, Seth said, taking Joanna's hand as she blushed. You're a little behind, father, Cindy said with a mischievous smile. We've been seeing this for a long time. Joanna blushed even more. And Franklin passes the baton to Burke, who completes his part of the marathon, said the radio presenter. Team Bo has a significant advantage over the Bradley Rangers. The real race is now for third place as the rock and fire teams are close together in the last kilometer of the first leg of the race. Todd Burke is running light and fast. Bradley passes the baton Bradley, but it will take an incredible effort for the Rangers to catch up with young Todd Burke. Most of us gathered at the fair, near the finish line. My mother, Laura, Cindy, Teresa, Dr. Eckhart, and his entourage. I looked around the crowd and finally saw what I wanted and expected to see. I'll take Carol for a little walk. I said to Laura, holding my daughter, I'll be back at the finish line. Fine, said Laura. I kissed her on the lips, then walked towards Riverside Avenue and towards the city. People had already begun to gather, lining the road to see the end of the race. Police also began strengthening their checkpoints and barricades. The participants of the first stage, delivered to the finish line, were also preparing for the arrival of their race partners. And here's Todd Burke, said the radio presenter. He looks like the young god Mercury, as if he's gliding down the road on winged sandals. The other members don't even come close to him. Now he's passing by the police department. Todd ran down the road, maintaining a fast but comfortable pace. He was exhausted, but energized, knowing the finish line was close. Come on, brother, he heard a whisper. Don't give up. Run across the finish line, not just towards it. Todd couldn't believe it. The sun to his right seemed to cast a strange light, almost like a material form, and he recognized it as his brother Jack. No, he thought. This can't be. This must be a hallucination, like Teresa had last year. Todd ran on relentlessly, seeing the people lining the street, seeing all the police officers in front of the headquarters, seeing the Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts who had volunteered to set up water stations along the race routes, now gathered to cheer the runners at the finish line. There was a woman in a shawl with a crowd of people. Is that my mother? Todd thought, understanding this with something more than simple intuition. You did it, he heard a voice as he turned the corner towards the fair and the finish line. Now avenge me, avenge my death. Didn't my uncle already do this? Todd asked his ghostly brother in the silence of his head. Only partially, said the voice of Jack Burke. Even he doesn't know everything, but you will avenge me. Suddenly the sun blinded Todd when he crossed the finish line. The vision disappeared. I heard cheers as Todd approached, then saw him turn into the fairgrounds toward the finish line. Indeed, he looked like a young god from mythological times as he ran across the finish line, and many a woman's eyes sparkled with sexual desire as they watched him. Not least the eyes of Teresa Croyle. Todd and Teddy Franklin hugged for a moment, then Todd headed to the paramedics to get checked out and hydrated, and get some blood drawn. All participants were tested for the presence of illegal drugs. Yes, even in amateur races like this. These were the consequences of a scandal at the university a year earlier. It will take a few minutes before the other competitors finish the race. My family gathered around Todd to congratulate him. I looked at him curiously. He wasn't smiling his usual charming smile. I thought he looked like he had seen a ghost. Well done, Todd, Carol exclaimed, clapping her hands as I shook Todd's hand. 
His mischievous smile returned as he tickled Carol's tummy, making her laugh loudly. Laura and my mother congratulated Todd and Teddy as well. Then the crowd of people swallowed up the winners and Carol, and I went back to watch the rest of the race finish. And here comes Bradley, with a comfortable lead over the third fire team, who passed the rock team in the final leg of the race, said the radio presenter. Some time later I heard his voice, and here is Hewitt from the police team. He looks exhausted, ladies and gentlemen, he can barely stand. Sensing trouble, I approached the paramedics near the finish line and told them to be ready to treat Hewitt. Of course, when he ran onto the road to the finish line, he ran heroically, but could barely stay on his feet. Gasping, he crossed the line and fell to his knees. Paramedics immediately rushed to his side to treat him. They had to put him on and Roman four before releasing him. I looked at Claire Michaels, his racing partner, and I thought, his girlfriend. To my surprise, there was not an ounce of concern on her face, only contempt and disgust. Wow, I thought, press the panic button trouble in paradise, and I had no idea how big these problems were. At the award ceremony, Todd had a big smile on his face, but Teddy was a little more subdued as the gold medals were placed around their necks. Congratulations from the Bradley Rangers were a bit formal. They were more than disappointed to be silver medalists for the second year in a row, and this time so convincingly that it must have been demoralizing. I congratulated the fire team, as did Sheriff Allgood, for their bronze medal. I noticed Bettina Wurzberg and Priya Ejmani competing to interview Todd and Teddy, followed by journalists trying to get photos. They tried to get the Bradley Rangers to pose with other teams, but the Rangers refused and left. I couldn't blame them. Rangers were trained to win, and there are no silver medals in war. It was difficult to get out of this mentality, I realized. Then some journalists wanted Todd and Teddy to pose with the winners of last year's race. Teresa agreed, standing next to Todd. Cindy was much less eager, but did her duty for a few photos. It was then that I realized how much it really hurt Cindy that she couldn't race again, despite her reluctance to show it. She was a competitor and a winner at heart, so I did what any good cop partner would do. I walked up to her and handed Carol to her, saying, Carol, tell Cindy how proud your dad is of you. Carol had no words for this, so she simply hugged Cindy. Cindy hugged my daughter back and looked at me, her ice-blue eyes sparkling a little. How touching, states Sen. Catherine Woodburn told us rep. Gary A. Condor. Scrap Iron has won again. Calm down, Catherine, said Condor. As a politician, you know these things change. We will defeat him. Just wait until Priya's revelation about the Jack Burke tapes and her story about my friend Jonas Olded's murderer comes out. Your friend Scrap Iron won't be so happy then. Stupid, Catherine thought to herself, referring to the Condor. Aloud she said, Oh, that's okay. We have to dig much deeper to destroy Scrap Iron. And I have a friend. A friend who will do just that. Her smile widened as she thought about what would happen. At that moment, the Newton sisters, Julie and Yvonne, arrived. Senator, Congressman, Julie said, introducing herself. May I introduce my sister, Yvonne? She is an assistant to Deputy District Attorney Paulin Patterson. Oh, really? Condor said, his thoughts beginning to open up to possibilities. Julie was a police detective and her sister worked for the assistant district attorney. Could these young women be bribed to betray Ironbreaker and his allies? He thought. Meanwhile, Condor was pouring out his charm on both black-haired beauties, and they pretended to be enchanted, Catherine noted with a mixture of amusement and disgust. Sunday, July 5th, 18 o'clock. The party at the shack was in full swing. It was a family celebration of Todd's race win, post-Independence Day, and just a celebration of who was here to celebrate. A year ago today, Cindy Ross lay on the gym floor, nearly dead. I made sure that she was not on duty today and would not be called into duty. History will not repeat itself, at least not on this day. In attendance were myself, Laura, our children, Molly, Ross, Cindy, Jenna, Tanya Perlman, 
her little son Pete, Todd, his little son Doug, Teresa, Teddy, my mother Phillies, Daniel and Melina all good, and their son Daniel, Paul and Patterson, Martin Nash, Sandra Spear, Jack Muscone, Joanna Cummings, Seth Warner, Barry Oliver, Myron Milton, Mary Mahoney Milton, Wes Cold Iron Masters, Theo Washington, his brother Assistant District Attorney Franklin Washington, Teddy Parker, Jiger of the, the Fight Against Illegal Drugs, Julie Newton, Yvonne Newton, Bettina Wurzberg, her Aunt Elsie Gringer, and of course, the tireless Bauer. I was worried that Bauer would be surrounded by so many people, and he was actually a little skittish. He remembered Joanna and allowed her to hold and stroke him, while the rest of the people gave him space. The children remained in the attic, looked after by several volunteers in rotation, and Bauer mostly stayed with them. He looked after Carol, but also kept the other children under his protection. My mother came up to me as the party got going. I think we'll have a surprise today, she said, her eyes sparkling. Seth and Joanna, I asked. My mother smiled. I noticed the same thing she did. And about an hour later, Seth gathered everyone in the living room. That's it. Dynacorp is now officially and legally part of Bo Enterprises, said Seth. I'm glad to be part of a winning team, especially one that won the triathlon. A little laughter and applause. Seth then said, but I'm even more excited to be part of an even better partnership that I intend to keep forever. He took Joanna's hand and pulled her towards him, then got down on one knee and took a small box from his pocket. He opened it, revealing a sparkling wedding ring, and asked a question. She said yes. Bauer barked at the door to the attic. Melina and Tanya were on babysitting duty and Melina opened the door and let Bauer out. Bauer ran down the stairs, through the living room, and along the porch walkway to his exit through the fence. He ran down his path. Oh, he went to relieve himself. I said when the guests wondered what the dog does during the day. And then we were distracted by the arrival of an unexpected guest on a motorcycle. P. Harvey Eckhart arrived. Alone. No followers, no bodyguards. Ah, young Donald. He said. I am very pleased to accept your kind invitation. I'm glad you accepted, I said as Harvey handed me a case of wine. We went inside, where we met everyone's approval of his arrival. Cindy rushed to hug her father and accompany him to the party, introducing him where necessary. I noticed my mother and Jack Muscone were missing when Eckhart showed up. They were upstairs on babysitting duty, which allowed Melina and Tanya to come down. Jack and Phillies avoided Eckhart. Young Donald, you know how it works. Eckhart said as he and Cindy led the procession to the kitchen. Yes, I know, I said. I grabbed a random bottle of wine, opened it, and poured three glasses. One for Eckhart, one for Cindy, one for me. We knocked our glasses together and I said, Salud, Eckhart drank first. This was a symbolic test to show that the wine was not poisoned and it was something Eckhart took very seriously when given something to drink. Any security I thought I had paled in comparison to the measures Eckhart took to defeat his many enemies. Eckhart congratulated Seth and Joanna on their engagement, then had a long talk with Daniel and Melina, while Laura and I brought more food and drinks. Elsie Gringer, now having her own social story about Seth and Joanna's engagement, was now upstairs with my mother Phillies, which meant that all the gossip of the neighborhood would be discussed and sorted out. While pouring wine for the guests, I noticed Todd approach Tanya Perlman. After greeting Tanya and congratulating Todd on Todd's victory, I was amazed to hear him say, I need to talk to you. I want to know more about the murder case of my brother Jack. Why don't you ask your uncle, Tanya said. He opened it. I know, but I need your perspective on this. Todd answered. I also think you should look into whether Jack Arusio was really acting out of revenge for his betrayal, or if there was something more to it. He got Tanya's attention, and they left before I could hear more. It was getting late, the sun was beginning to set behind the western horizon. Some of the guests said their goodbyes, and Todd's group from Bo and Teresa and Joanna were in the front lounge, mostly discussing their race. I noticed Eckhart sitting on the metal mesh two-seater bench I usually sat on, Cindy sitting next to him on the left. 
Realizing that this was the right thing to do, I walked over and sat down on the chair at the table to Harvey's right. Ah, young Donald, yes, join us, said Eckhart. I told you last year that I would come back this year to talk with you. I think it's time for that conversation. Certainly, I said. So, what's in store for us this year? Danger, my young nephew. Danger, said Eckhart. You both begin the destruction of one of the most powerful networks of evil ever created. You must be on guard at all times and be prepared for anything. Especially you, Don. You have a very long and lonely road ahead of you before this is all over. I'll be with him every step of the way, said Cindy. Ah, oh, my dear, Eckhart said, almost sadly, you will indeed work with him, but you cannot share young Donald's ordeal. He must go through this alone. You'll see what I mean. I'll tell you when the time comes. I was already trying to understand what kind of threat this could be. At that moment, Bauer jumped onto the veranda. He looked at the three of us, and when Eckhart said, Hey, little dog, Bauer jumped into Eckhart's lap. Oh, such a good dog. Eckhart said, his voice almost a whisper as he petted Bauer and rubbed his back. And that reminds me, remember this, both of you, your shadow man has a deep hatred of dogs. Oh, really? I whispered, more to myself than to others. Ah, yes, young Donald, Eckhart said, his voice becoming even more hoarse than usual. That piece of dirt, Brian Thatcher. Did you think he acted alone in his experiments on and torture of these dogs? I, I never thought about it, I said, and then the possibilities began to explode inside my mind. Yes, my friends, Thatcher worked for a terrible man, said Eckhart. What this dog, who was lucky to survive, suffered at the hands of this man is indescribable to me. I cannot even think about those atrocities. They are as bad as what happened in that insane asylum near my headquarters. I looked at Bauer. And he'll pay for it, Bauer. I promised. He'll pay. Bauer flicked his tail, meeting my gaze with his dog eyes. There was one final act of celebration at the party. Teresa and Molly led the large group of remaining guests onto the veranda, carrying a paper bundle. I know you already know what it is, Cindy. I said as Teresa approached her. And this is not in memory of what happened to you or what you experienced, but that you overcame it and are still with us. Yes, said Molly, and you can use it to keep the bad guys in check and keep the commander in line. Teresa said with fun. Everyone laughed. Cindy unwrapped the gift. It was a new blue crowbar made from the best parts of a machine gun from Wargrave's arsenal that was used a year ago, Teresa said. A certain black scrap the commander gave us, but didn't tell us where it came from, and the scrap you used to win police boxing matches. This black one, the crowbar, was the one Wargrave used ineffectively in his final fight with Cindy before being thrown out the window. How does it feel, child? Her father asked as Cindy picked up a new blue crowbar and waved it then tapped it on the palm of her other hand. How does it feel to you? Fine. Cindy said, understanding the father's meaning. It feels right, just perfect. Thanks, guys. The party began to disperse. Molly stayed overnight and will return to Midtown in the morning. My mother Phillies also stayed behind, spending a few more hours with her grandson Ross. After Cindy and Jenna left, Cindy and Molly hugged warmly and promised to meet again soon. Just use this blue crowbar to protect Don. I heard Molly say, I heard what Dr. Eckhart told him, Don will need your help. And yours, said Cindy, but we will win and we will celebrate. Neither woman had any idea, I thought, what this celebration would require. I looked over the city, saw the train emerging onto the western horizon, and prepared for the upcoming battle. Night fell on the hut, and the last guests began to leave. The family members and close friends who remained on the veranda sat in a circle, enjoying the warm evening and the remaining wine. I stood watching the stars and thought about the year ahead. Eckhart was right, danger was close, and I had a lot to endure. Cindy walked up to me, holding a blue crowbar in her hands. She looked confident and strong. 
I know what awaits us, she said. We can handle it. I nodded. With your support, Cindy, we will overcome anything. She smiled, and in her eyes I saw the same determination that helped her. Survive last year. We returned to the others, where Molly was telling some funny story from her childhood. As I laughed, I felt the warmth and support of my family and friends. Eckhart stood up and walked over to us. I'm glad to see you all being so united, he said. This will be your main advantage. Thanks, Harvey, I replied. We will always stick together. Eckhart smiled, but his eyes remained serious. Remember that evil will always find a way to infiltrate even the strongest society. Be vigilant and never lose faith in each other. With these words, he said goodbye and rode off on his motorcycle, leaving us with thoughts of the upcoming trials. My mother came up to me and took my hand. You're strong, Don, she said. You will get through this, and remember that we are always here. I hugged her, feeling her support and love. Thank you, Mom. Gradually, the guests began to leave. Teresa and Teddy helped clean up the remains of the party while I walked Cindy to her car. Be careful, she said, hugging me. I am always near. And you too, I replied. We'll get through this, together. When the last guest left, I closed the door of the shack and went to the backyard. Bauer, my faithful friend, followed me. We sat on a bench and watched the night sky. I thought about Eckhart's words and what awaits us. But at that moment, under the starry sky and surrounded by silence, I felt that we could overcome anything. Faith, Love and support from family and friends will give us the strength to cope with any difficulties. A new day would bring new challenges, but I was ready to face them. Along with Cindy, Bauer, and everyone else, I knew we could win. And when the time comes, we will celebrate our victory once again. With these thoughts, I got up and went into the house. Tomorrow would begin a new chapter of our story, and I was ready to accept it with an open heart and confidence in the future. Subscribe to our channel so that your love doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think click to the next one. Click to the next one. Click to the next one.